Let's all say together, for the Lord is good and his mercy endures forever. Hallelujah. Thank you for being here today. Open your Bibles to Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews chapter 11. This chapter, the chapter 11, is often referred to as the Hall of Faith. It tells us what faith is, and then it gives us accounts of those who walked by faith. We're only going to read verse 1 at this point, although I will read other passages of Scripture through this. My time is a little bit limited today in some ways, and so I'm going to try to cover the basics. And I hope that your attention is given so that you can hear this. Let's all stand in honor of God's Word, if you can. Hebrews chapter 11. This verse here is often used as the definition, the biblical definition of faith. It says, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. I want to read that again. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. The title of the message today is Walking by Faith. Walking by Faith. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you today, Lord, for your word. And you, Lord, you said in Romans 10, 17, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of the Lord. So, Father, we thank you today that we have an opportunity to hear, and Lord, an opportunity to respond and grow in faith. Lord, I pray that today that you would open our eyes to see, our ears to hear, and our heart to understand all that you have for us, and we'll give you the glory, honor, and praise for all that you do in, the, in our hearts and those who listen. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. you. may be seated. Walking by faith. If there's ever been a time that God's people need to walk in faith, now is that time. The world is getting dark, and in the dark you can't see, but if you walk in faith, you can see. You can see clearly when the darkness is all around you. So I want to ask you, are you walking by faith? The Bible tells us in Hebrews eleven six 6 that we cannot please God without faith. How many of you want to please God in your life? If you're going to please God in your life, you're going to have to walk by faith. Listen to what it says. But without faith, it is impossible to please Him. For he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. No question. If we want to please God, we must have faith. All right. Also, we live by faith. Galatians 3.11. But that no one is justified by the law in the sight of God is evident for the just shall live by faith. If you're trying to work your way to heaven, then stop. You can't find a ladder that tall. Amen. There's no way to get to heaven on your own merit. If you're hoping that God will somehow let you in, that you're good enough, forget it. You say, well, I'm in trouble then. Yes, we were all in trouble. And that's why Jesus Christ came to make it possible for us to be with him forever. Amen. Amen. Jesus did what you could not do, and all you have to do is believe in what He did so that what He did can be applied to you, His righteousness given to your account. Amen? Given to you as a gift. Not only do we live by faith, we walk by faith. 2 Corinthians 5, 7, For we walk by faith, not by sight. And that's a hard one because we're usually of that frame of mind, I won't believe it till I see it. That's the way most people think. But if you're going to walk with God, you've got to believe it before you see it. Amen. Now, if you haven't been living by faith, living the faith life is going to sound pretty crazy to you. You're not going to understand people who walk by faith because they're living by something they cannot see. And people say, oh, it's just all make-believe. No, it's not make-believe. It's just that they see a realm that you don't see. It's, it's more real than what you can see. In fact, the things you can see were made from the things you cannot see. 
These things that you see are going to pass away, but the things you cannot see are going to be eternal. So we walk by faith, not by sight. Not only do we live by faith and walk by faith, we die in faith. Hebrews eleven thirteen. This is in the hall of faith. Hebrews 11. It said, these all died in faith. Not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off, were assured of them, embraced them, and confessed they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. These died in faith. You sure don't want to die in unbelief. Amen? I want to die in faith looking over the horizon at the promise of God on the other side. We die in faith. Now, I want to say there's, there's a lot of confusion about faith. And sometimes people get disillusioned because maybe they're praying for a certain outcome. And it didn't turn out that way. Anybody prayed for something and it didn't turn out that way? <laughs> sometimes we'll have a prayer chain going, praying that somebody will be healed or someone will live and not die and we're leaning into faith, but it didn't turn out that way. And so sometimes we base all of our faith on whether or not that one thing happened or didn't happen. And some people say, well, I just can't believe in God anymore. Because that one thing didn't happen. But let me say this. Faith is not an event. Faith is a journey. Faith is a journey. Marriage is not just a wedding ceremony, is it? <laughs> Amen? Marriage is a journey. And we're learning along that journey. As I was meditating on this, there were some things that came to mind. I want to share them with you. First of all, it is a journey with the invisible God. God is invisible. His attributes are invisible, but He says that creation is a display of of what we cannot see of Him, but He has revealed His invisible attributes even through the things that are made. God's trying to show Himself to us even when our eyes cannot see Him. It's a walk by faith and not by sight. Because if I'm going to walk with God, I'm going to be walking by faith because I sure can't see Him with my natural eyes. It is a pilgrimage to a place we belong but we've never been there before. You see, I'm headed to glory. I'm headed toward heaven. This earth is not my home. I've never been there, but my heart says I belong there. I've never seen it, but man, it's my homeland. Faith is a journey through a land of shadows to a land of light. It's a journey through a foreign land. To, a, to an eternal homeland. It is a journey from earthly Babylon, which represents this earthly system, to the heavenly Jerusalem. It is a journey through the temporal on our way to the eternal. It is a journey that passes through the doorway of death. When we think of death, and so many people think of death as final, but for the believer, death is not final. Death has no more power over the believer. 1 Corinthians 15 says, death has no power. The grave has no hold. Death has lost its sting. You see, death is simply, as it were, a doorway into the presence of God. And just like a woman who is having birth pangs, waiting to deliver that child from the realm of the womb into the realm of this world. So it is the birth pangs of death, whether that birth comes easy or whether it comes prolonged. Right? You don't know how long that, that birth process is going to take. But whether it's short or whether it's long or whether it's easy or whether it's hard... When it's finally done, it's ushered us into eternity. Amen? Into the presence of God. So faith, 
holds on to God regardless of current circumstances. Whether things are easy or whether things are hard. Whether you understand or whether you don't understand. And there's a lot I don't understand. But I know by walking with God and studying His Word, I don't have to understand everything. Amen? There's a lot of things I could never understand, like trying to explain how an engine works to a two-year-old. There's some things you're just going to have to wait. And there's some things that we're not going to understand until we see Him face to face. It's like trying to understand what a parade is that's ten blocks long by looking through a knothole in a fence. You can't see the whole thing. You can't see the whole picture. But once you understand the whole picture, then the little scene through the knot hole will begin to make sense. There are things that happen in our life we don't understand. But people question during that time, where was God? Why didn't God answer like I expected? And if God didn't answer my prayer, does He even exist? Friends, I understand those times can be a test of your faith. And that's what it is. It is a test of your faith. And so there are two aspects of faith. Usually it's the one where we believe and we receive the answer. That's the good one. Amen. That's the thing we say, hey, I got a praise report. I had a $300 electric bill. I had $100 in the bank. My lights were supposed to go off tomorrow, but I prayed, God, meet my need. And someone came up and did one of those praise the Lord handshakes and gave me $200. They didn't know I needed that. They just said, God told me to do this for you. And you're thinking, God provided. Hallelujah. He answered my prayer. Amen. We, we like those kind of testimonies. They help build our faith. But what about those testimonies where it didn't work out quite that way? Amen. Such was the case of Job. Job prayed for his kids. Job chapter 1, he thought, man, they're, they're messing up. They're having parties. They're doing sinful things. But, man, i got to go do some sacrifices. Lord, spare their life. Along comes the devil, Satan. God says, where you been? He said, well, I've been walking around the earth, looking around. You know, the Bible says he roams about as a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. God's, God says that the Satan is like a lion seeking to devour. And God said, have you seen my, uh, considered my servant Job? He said, well, I can't touch him. You've got a hedge around him. And the only reason he's serving you, God, is because you've given him everything. You've blessed him so much. That's the only reason he's serving you. Did you know there's some people, the only reason they're serving God is because of what, how good life has been? God says, okay, you can test him. And then one day he lost everything except his wife. And she wasn't very encouraging. She just said, curse God and die. Might as well get it over with. You don't need those kind of people around you. Thank God I don't have a wife like that. Amen. She's in my corner pushing me on. Hallelujah. But Job, after losing everything, you would have thought he would just curse God and die, but he didn't. He didn't wallow in self-pity. Job chapter 1, verse 20 through 22, it said, Then Job arose, tore his robe, shaved his head, he fell to the ground, and worshipped. And he said, Naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked I shall return there. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. In all this, Job did not sin nor charge God with wrong. Wow. Everything fell apart, and Job's faith held on to God as he fell down and worshipped. God, everything I have came from you, and if you take it all, it's yours anyway. Amen? So Job's faith was not in a temporal outcome. He was hanging on to the end. Amen? Job thirteen fifteen says, this is what Job says when his friends were saying, you've got to have done something wrong. You might as well just curse God too. I mean, you've, you've done bad. Job 13, 15, though he slay me, Job says, yet will I trust him. Even so, I will defend my own ways before him. 
Job was saying, I don't understand what's going on. It didn't work out the way I thought, but I know this. My God is righteous, He's just, and He's true. And one day I'm going to stand before Him, and it's going to be done right. It's going to be made right. I'm going to understand, and He's going to understand. Job thought maybe God had missed something. Maybe if I could just appear before Him and tell Him some facts He's not aware of, maybe He would say, oh, I didn't realize that. <laughs> Sorry, Job. <laughs> we'll get this straightened out. Rewind, okay? Such faith was evident in the life of David. David had committed sin. He had committed adultery. A child was conceived. To cover it up, he plotted to have the man killed in a battle. Where it was all hidden and his, he thought his hands were clean. But a prophet came and said, uh-uh-uh, God knows what you did. Oh, now David married Bathsheba. He did that before the prophet showed up. He thought, well, we'll have this baby, and this baby will look like it's my baby, and it is. The prophet said, but the baby's going to die. We don't like to have kids die, babies die. God said the, the baby's going to die. So what did David do? He thought, well, God's a merciful God. I'm going to pray, and I'm going to ask him to change his mind. And he prayed, and he prayed, and he prayed. He wept, he fasted, and he did all of these things. It says in verse 2 Samuel 12, verse 19 through 23, When David saw that his servants were whispering, David perceived the child was dead. Therefore David said to his servants, is the child dead? And they said, He is dead. So David arose from the ground, washed and anointed himself, changed his clothes, and went into the house of the Lord and worshipped. Then he went to his house, and when he had requested, they set food before him, and he ate. Then his servants said to him, What is this you've done? You fasted and wept for the child when he was alive, but when the child died, you rose and ate food. And he said, while the child was alive, I fasted and wept. And I said, who can tell whether the Lord will be gracious to me that the child may live? But now he is dead. Why should I fast? Can I bring him back again? I shall go to him, but he shall not return to me. David had lost a child. That's a heartbreaking thing to lose a child. But, jo but David held on to his faith. And he realized that baby's death was not the end. He said, I, he can't come to me. But one day I'm going to him. You see, whatever we commit to the Lord is never lost. You can't lose something if you know where it's at. Right? It's not lost if you know where it's at. Loved ones who've gone on to the Lord, we talk about, well, I lost my daddy or I lost my mom or I lost my kid or I lost this. Or lo Look, if they are in the presence of the Lord, there's a reunion day coming. And the thing that's going to get you all together is faith. All hanging on to God all the way to the end. Amen. Such was evident in the life of Peter. Peter was a man you thought had faith. His faith was in Jesus that he's going to conquer all his enemies. He's going to sit on the throne in Jerusalem. I mean, and we're going to be his ambassadors right there sitting around on 12 thrones around, his, around him. But Jesus kept saying, uh-uh, that's not the way it's going to happen. I'm going to go to Jerusalem. I'm going to be betrayed into the hands of my enemy. I'm going to be crucified and three days later rose, rise again. Oh, Jesus, that will never be. Jesus said, get behind me, Satan. See, sometimes we don't understand the plan of God. And that's why we get confused and disoriented. And sometimes we get to the place we get disillusioned with God. God, why? And when it began to happen, just like Jesus said, Peter thought, Oh my goodness, everything's falling apart. Peter had already said, if everybody else denies you, I'm going to stay the course. I got faith. I got faith in you, Jesus. But when Jesus was betrayed, he began the process of being crucified. Peter denied him and he ran away and hid. But Jesus said to him, Peter, I have prayed for you 
that your faith would not fail. You see, Jesus knew a test was coming. He said, the devil wants to sift you like wheat. Some of you may be just like that. The devil wants to sift you as wheat. But Jesus is praying for you. The Bible says that Jesus is even now at the right hand of the Father making intercession for us. If you've truly believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, you may fail along the way. You may stumble in your faith. But if you truly have given your heart and life to Jesus, he's up there praying. Come on, don't give up. Keep on going. You're not going to quit. I'm praying for you that your faith will not fail. And there's been many times, I think in my life and your life, that we could say if it wasn't for the hand of God, our faith would have failed. But we are here by the grace of God, the intercessions of Jesus and Peter rose up, not only did he regain full assurance in the resurrection, but he went on to preach one of the greatest sermons on the day of Pentecost. 3,000 people got saved. I hadn't even got close to that. It was also evident in the case of Mary and Martha. Remember Mary and Martha, they were the sisters of Lazarus, and Jesus regarded Mary, Martha, and Lazarus as some of his closest friends on earth. He spent time at their house. Mary sat at his feet and listened to his teaching. Martha was the servant, hospitality, gift of hospitality lady, you know, and we know those stories. But there was a time Jesus was not there and Lazarus got sick, sick unto death. And so they sent and said, Jesus sent a message. Jesus, come pray for Lazarus. He's dying. Jesus waited four days. That doesn't sound like a very compassionate God. I mean, we need an answer right now. We need an intervention right now. But Jesus waited four days. And then he said, all right, let's go. Lazarus is sleeping. Because Lazarus had died. Well, so, but Master, if he's sleeping, that means that's good. He's getting some rest. His body's going to recover. He goes, no. Lazarus has died. And so when they get there, Martha comes out and said, Oh Lord, if you had been here, Lazarus would not have died. Sometimes we say, God, you're too late. But Jesus was right on time. There was something that God was after they didn't understand. And sometimes in not getting what we want, God's got something bigger planned amen he's got something else he wants to do and it's not always about the person that died it's about the people who are alive and how they're going to deal with it because it's a test of their faith and he says he's going to live again oh lord i know one of these days at the resurrection he's going to live again yes i i took christianity 101 i understand that You know, we fall back on some little, you know, doctrinal thing. We put faith off into the future. Doesn't require faith right now. And Jesus, what do you say? John chapter 11, verse 25 through 26. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? Do you see what Jesus was after? She was putting her faith in a certain outcome. Jesus was wanting her to put her faith in him. Because when you have him, everything you need is in him. You see, tests come. They come to all of us. They come, come to me. I've been through lots of tests. At the time, they're not fun. Anybody took tests in school? Tests aren't fun. But they're needed because they let us know if we've learned anything. So tests, for those who've studied and those who know their material, those who have true faith, tests are not a threat to true faith. Tre tests only prove and refine faith for those who have it. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 6 through 9. 
Peter, remember the guy that thought he had faith and really didn't have faith, and then he had faith again, and now he's telling other people a little bit about what he learned, and sometimes it's about us learning something to tell other people what they need to do when they go through their trial. He said, in this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while, everybody say a little while, if need be, you have been grieved by various trials. That, now this is the purpose, that the genuineness of your faith being more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to praise, honor, and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ, whom having not seen you love, though now you do not see him, yet believing, you rejoice with joy inexpressible and full of glory and receiving the end of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Do you see what he's saying there? He said, you may be going through some trials right now, but they're temporary. He said, but what's going to happen through this, the fire that you're going through, is your faith is going to be refined into precious gold. That's going to testify of the greatness of our God when you see Jesus. I want to know when I see Jesus, he doesn't say, oh, you of little faith. I hope he can say, you remain faithful. And by the way, faithfulness is exercising faith long term. Right? It's easy to have faith for a moment. But have faith every day and be faithful every day. That's walking in faith faithfully. That's what the faithful life is. So test, prove, and refine the gold of genuine faith. They also reveal the strengths and weaknesses of our faith. There's been times, tests show me I'm not really passing the faith test. There's weaknesses. I mean, we're in, a, we're in a time right now in our country, God's trying to test our faith. We put our faith in a lot of temporal things, and now as those things begin to shake, and He said, I'm going to shake everything that can be shaken, so that those things that cannot be shaken will remain. Well, if we've been building our life and faith in what? We have in our bank, in our retirement, properties. When those things began to shake, our faith is going to be shown to be weak. But if we put our faith in what is eternal, which is the kingdom of God, then it doesn't matter what's going on around us. Because my economy is not based upon Washington, D.C. In the wilderness... God had to bring them out of Egypt to say, it's time to stop depending on Pharaoh. It's time to stop depending on Egypt. It's time to stop depending on those things. And remember, I am your provider. He provided bread in the wilderness, water from a rock, everything they needed in the wilderness. He was trying to say, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. God's trying to teach us that right now. There's a test going on. Maybe you're not doing so well. Tests reveal where our faith is strong and unwavering. It also reveals where our faith is missing, minuscule, misplaced, or misguided. Sometimes we put faith in things that aren't biblical. We expect God to do certain things that He never promised. And then when He doesn't do it, we think, well, God, you didn't keep your promise. And God says, I never promised that. Reminds me of a song. I never promised you a rose garden. <laughs> Matthew 6, 30. Jesus said, Now if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is and tomorrow is thrown into ov the oven, will He not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? We can be of little faith. Tests remind us that faith must be founded upon the Word, watered by the Word, and receive the sunlight of God's presence in prayer. Folks, you may start off with a little bit of prayer, but keep it growing. Keep it growing. How are you going to believe for God to meet your needs in a hard time if you won't, can't even believe Him to put food on your table right now? We need to start looking to God and getting God's direction and wisdom for what we do have. Stop living on everything you have and start asking God, God, what did you give me this for? Amen? Don't eat your seed. You've got to plant that seed. 
God gives you what, something to live on, something to sow. Some of us eat everything, and then we wonder why we don't have a harvest. Tests reveal the presence or absence of love. You ever found in a test you can kind of be unloving? Stress? Frustration? People get on your last nerve? But tests reveal how strong our love walk is. Galatians 5, 6, For in Christ Jesus neither circumcision nor uncircumcision avail anything but faith working through love. How does faith work? Through love. So you can have faith but not love, and I tell you, you're, going to pass, you're, going to, you're not going to pass the faith test. So, faith is not in a temporal outcome. Ultimately, faith is in a person. It's what Jesus reminded Martha. Martha, don't put your faith in Lazarus' situation in the, in the tomb. Put your faith in me. I'm the resurrection. I am the life. Do we trust in God regardless of the outcome? Do we trust in God when things are only good? Or do we trust in God when things don't pan out the way we think? Romans 8, 28. And we know that all things work together for good to those who love God. The Geneva Bible says we know all things work together for the best. To those who love God, those who are called according to His purpose. Look, not everything is good in and of itself. But it says, it doesn't say that everything in life is going to be good. But it says God works all things together for good. Use the illustration. There may be some new ones here. haven't heard it. But if you're going to tell your child we're going to eat chocolate cake. How many of you like chocolate cake? All right. So we're going to make chocolate cake. We're going to, we're going to eat chocolate cake, but today we don't have time to, to actually make it. So I've got all the ingredients set out on the counter. And we're going to eat chocolate cake one ingredient at a time. Here's a cup of flour. When you get through with the flour, then we'll give you a stick of butter. We'll let you wash it down with a little milk. We'll give you some cocoa. You ever tried to eat powdered cocoa? Woo! <laughs> Here's a cup of sugar. Well, but you get, man, that'd make you sick. And so you go through this whole process, and the kid said, Mama, Daddy, I don't like chocolate cake. <laughs> and that's the way it is in our Christian life. Sometimes we think, I don't like being a Christian. But it says here, he works all things together. You put them all in that pot. I used to watch my mom. I watched Sheila. They cook. They put all this stuff in there, and they start working it all together. Amen? Working it all together. And then they put it in the fire. Amen? We don't like the fire. But once you put it in the fire, the good smell starts coming out. If that person has got it all mixed up, right, Jesus has got it all mixed up in the, the fire. People will be watching your life go, I don't understand how something that good smelling is coming out of that fire. And then they take it out and everybody's going, I like chocolate cake. Look, tough things happen to good people. We must lean forward in faith. Hebrews eleven thirteen. These all died in faith, not having received the promise, but having seen them afar off, were assured of them. Second Corinthians five verse six through eight. So we are confident, knowing that while we are in, at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord. For we walk by faith, not by sight. We are confident. Yes, well pleased, rather to be absent from the body, and to be present with the Lord. What he's saying is this life here is like living in a tent. This is just camping out here, but we're moving on through this life. We've got our eyes on eternity. We've got our eyes on heaven. We've got our eyes when all the promises of God that we may not have all experienced on this life become fully realized on the other side. So regardless of what the outcome is, Always lean in your faith toward God. 
someone says, well, it's impossible that this person's ever going to be healed. I don't care. I'm going to lean in faith for healing. Amen? If they get worse every day and eventually die, I'm still leaning forward in faith. Knowing that if God didn't raise them up on this side, he did, he did heal them on the other side. And I know this, that God's after something beyond just him getting healed. Just like he was looking for something beyond Lazarus getting healed so he did not die. God's after something in us. He's after something. Just this last week, I preached a funeral and that place was full. We prayed for this person to be healed. They weren't healed. But you know what? They had had a testimony because right here at this altar, we prayed two years ago for them to receive Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. Amen. Right here. September 19th, 2019. And you know what happened? That place was full. And they all heard the gospel. Based on his testimony. Because I gave it. There's people there that probably would have never heard the gospel. Probably never go in a church. But they showed up at a funeral. Don't limit God. Amen. Always Lean forward in faith and do not trust in your own understanding. Proverbs 3, verse 5 and 6. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge Him and He will direct your paths. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. I'm going to end with this verse. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 35 through 39, as Brother Dan comes. Always lean forward in faith and never draw back in unbelief. Listen, therefore do not cast away your confidence, which has great reward. Everybody say great reward. Great reward. For you have need of endurance. So that after you have done the will of God, you may receive the promise. For yet a little while, and he who is coming will come and will not tarry. Now the just shall live by faith. Everybody say, live by faith. But if anyone draws back, that's in unbelief. My soul has no pleasure in him. Why? Because it's impossible to please God without faith, right? But we are not of those who draw back to perdition but of those who believe to the saving of the soul. Folks, I'm of the camp of the believing. I'm the camp of the believing. We believe in God. We live by faith. We walk by faith. We die by faith. But we always put our faith in the God who we walk with in this journey. It's not an event. It is a lifestyle of faith. Trust Him when we understand and when we don't understand. Because we trust Him. Job says, I believe my Redeemer lives. And one day I'm going to see Him face to face. I don't understand what's going on right now. But I have a Redeemer. It's not always going to be this way. He's alive. And I'm going to see him. Are you ready to see him? Keep on believing. Keep on believing. Let's stand.